Okay, good morning. I'm very happy to introduce Monica Clapp from UNAM at Juriquillas in Mexico. And she will explain to us optimal partitions for the Yamabe equation. Monica, the zoom is yours. Thank you very much, Alicia, and thanks to all organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to share some mathematics today with you. So the first thing I would like to say is, well, I would like to, to apologize because I saw the website and it says the seminar is devoted to applications of geometry and topology to other fields of science or to other subjects. And uh, my talk will be, will go the other way around. So I, I used to be a topologist, but uh, well, I am not really a topologist anymore. I work in PDE. But I will be speaking about a problem in, in conformal geometry. And uh, what I will uh, explain is how one uses some ideas coming from, from physics to solve a geometrical problem. So, so this, my talk goes, say, in the opposite direction as it is intended in the seminar. But, uh, well, I hope you, you will have fun. So um, let me give you the outline of the talk. So I will start with uh, the Yamabe problem, recalling what the Yamabe problem is. And then I will uh, speak about optimal partitions. Then I will give you some existence and regularity results. And if I have time at the end, I will talk about uh, symmetric optimal partitions. So let me start with the Yamabe problem. So we have a a closed uh, Riemannian manifold of dimension M. So the manifold is uh, uh, compact and without boundary. G is the Riemannian metric. And of course, the same smooth manifold admits many different Riemannian metrics. So one way of classifying metrics is by conformal equivalence. So one says that two metrics, G and G twiddles on M, are conformally equivalent. If there is a smooth function on the manifold, the rho, which is positive, and such that one of the metrics is rho times the other, okay? So at each point, one metric is a multiple, a positive multiple of the other one, and the point varies, uh, and the, the, the coefficient, this constant, varies smoothly along the manifold. So then there is a, a very classical result, very well-known result, called the uniformization theorem. And this theorem is a theorem for surfaces. So it says if the manifold has dimension two, so if it is a surface, then every metric, and, and you have a, a given metric, then every metric can be replaced by another metric, which is conformally equivalent to the given one, and such that for the new metric, the surface has constant curvature. So this is a classical result that was proved more than a hundred years ago. And of course, a natural question is whether this result is, uh, remains to be true when the manifold has higher dimensions. So for surfaces, this is a classical result. And for manifolds of dimension larger than or equal to three, well, this is the Yamabe problem. So the Yamabe problem is, is it true that every closed Riemannian manifold with a metric G admits a, a, a new metric conformally equivalent to G for which the manifold has constant scalar curvature? Okay, so this is a kind of a, well, it's a natural generalization of uh, the previous result I mentioned for surfaces. And uh, Yamabe proved in 1960 that the answer was yes. So he gave a, he published a paper, he gave a positive answer. But unfortunately, unfortunately his, his proof was, uh, ha contained an important mistake. And this mistake was discovered by Trudinger eight years after Yamabe's proof. And uh, the proof, I mean, it was not just a simple mistake that one can fix uh, quickly. It took actually 25 years to, to be able to give a full answer. 
So uh, there was first uh, this paper by Yamabe, then eight years later there was this uh, paper by Trudinger. So Trudinger said, well, Yamabe's proof is correct in some cases, but in many interesting cases it is not correct. And then Oban gave a, an important contribution because he gave a condition for the, the Yamabe conjecture to be true. And this was eight years after Trudinger. So Oban gave a, a partial answer for many, many cases. And some cases remained, very difficult cases. And those were solved by Schoen in 1984. So this was very good actually, you know, because I mean when one has a conjecture like this that is difficult to prove, well many people have uh, work, so, so this gives something to do to many mathematicians and helps the development of mathematics. So how does one go about um, answering this question? Well the point is that um, if you have a metric G, you have your given metric G and you look for a new metric G twiddles that is conformally equivalent to G. This means it is a multiple by as a positive smooth function on the manifold. And if you write this positive smooth function like this, like u to the 2 to the star minus 2, where this 2 to the star is a magic number that depends only on the dimension of the manifold. Then Answering, giving a positive answer to, to, to the Yamabe problem is related to this equation because if you look at the, at the scalar curvature associated to G and the scalar curvature associated to the conformal metric G twiddles, then they satisfy this equation on the manifold M, where this uh, delta G is the Laplace Beltrami operator. Uh, this number AM is just a constant that depends on M and this 2 to the star is also a constant that depends only on M and uh, that is, is very well known in, in, in analysis, it is called the critical Sobolev exponent. So giving, answering the Yamabe problem means you put a constant here, right, because you want to to find a, a conformal metric with constant scalar curvature. So you put a constant on this side and you ask yourself whether this equation has a positive solution. So solving the Yamabe problem again is showing that this equation where k is a constant has a positive solution. And this operator on the left hand side which is uh, the sum of minus the conformal Laplacian plus this constant times the, the scalar curvature of the given metric, this operator here is called the conformal Laplacian. So <clears throat> if you take this, this uh, PDE and you multiply it by U and then integrate, then you see that uh, it suffices to show that this infimum is a tate. So the, the integral in, on the numerator is just the Laplace, but, uh, I mean the conformal Laplacian at u multiplied with u and integrated over m. And below what you have is the L2 norm of u, uh, the square of the L2 norm of u. So you look at this quotient for every uh, smooth function on M which is non-zero so that you, uh, so that this is defined, right? And uh, what one needs to do is one wants to see whether this infimum is attained, whether there is a function U that realizes this infimum. This infimum has a name, it is called the Yamabe invariant of the manifold and it is called the Yamabe invariant because it is com a, 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 an invariant under conformal transformations. So if you change the metric G, this, this number YM doesn't change. And this is the reason why this, this uh, uh, operator here is called the conformal Laplacian 
because it is invariant under conformal changes of the metric, and in fact under conformal diffeomorphisms, and this magic number, the, the, the critical Sobolev exponent, also has this property. So also the denominator is invariant under conformal transformations. So let me show you now a, a simple example, a, a, perhaps not so interesting example, but you will see that this example is interesting in regarding this question. So let us look at the standard sphere, at the round sphere in our m plus 1. Okay, so this is just the unit sphere with induced metric. And uh, well, if we look at the stereographic projection, so this is a conformal diffeomorphism, right? So since uh, this uh, Yamabe invariant and since these operators here uh, are conformally invariant, then looking at for solutions for the Yamabe equation on the sphere is the same as looking for solutions for the Yamabe equation in RM. So what is the Yamabe equation in RM? Well, the, the scalar, the, the laplace beltrami operator is just the usual Laplacian. The, the scalar curvature is constant. It is equal to zero, right? So what this says is that looking that the, the stereographic projection uh, establishes a one-to-one -one correspondence between solutions of the Yamabe equation on the round sphere and this equation in Rm, which is the Yamabe equation in Rm. And if we look at the Yamabe invariant, so what is the Yamabe invariant? So the Yamabe invariant, we can look at the Yamabe invariant here in Rm because it is equal to the Yamabe invariant in, uh, in Sm. And this is just this quotient. So this is, in this case, we have just the Laplacian. We have this integral, right? And then here, one can use the green formula and replace the, this expression in the numerator just by the integral of the gradient square of u. So what one gets is just this quotient. And this quotient is uh, very well known for people working in analysis and in PDE, and it is called the best constant for the Sobolev invariant. Anyhow, this, this quotient in RM, this infimum, is indeed attained, and, and one has an explicit expression for a function at which this infimum is attained. And this function looks like this. It's a very simple expression, and this U capital U is usually called the standard bubble. And uh, it turns out that the Yamabe equation, or rather this quotient, is invariant under dilations and, uh, and the translations. This means that if you look at this function, if you take the U and now for every positive epsilon, you look at this new function, this also realizes the Yamabe invariant, and every translation realizes the Yamabe invariant too. But what is the nice thing about this, this function? You see, as epsilon goes to zero, this u epsilon, well, goes to zero almost everywhere, except at the center. At the center, it blows up. And it is precisely this blow-up phenomenon what uh, uh, caused the mistake in, in Yamabe's proof. So, the error made by, by Yamabe was that, uh, well, was caused by this, by this uh, invariance of the problem on the uh, dilations. And so, the next uh, step in the story came from Oban. So, Oban said he gave a condition for the Yamabe invariant to be attained. He said, well, if the Yamabe invariant for the manifold M is strictly less than the Yamabe invariant for the sphere, then it is attained. Now, it is very easy to show that the Yamabe invariant for M is smaller than or equal to the Yamabe invariant for the sphere. And this is due to this uh, dilation invariance, because you take your manifold M, 
You take a point on the manifold and you take the tangent space. And on the tangent space, you have all of these functions that realize the Yamaba invariant for the sphere, right? So, uh, now you take on the tangent space, you take a ball that can be projected to the manifold by using the exponential map. And you take a cutoff function on this ball and just multiply the cutoff function by all of these guys. Okay? Since these guys are, are concentrating, the, uh, the quotient, the Yamabe quotient, will tend to the Yamabe quotient of the sphere. And so the, the non strict inequality is very easy to prove. But what one needs is the strict inequality. So, uh, Oban made some computations using precisely this uh, test function I, I just described, and he was able to prove that this test function I just described does the trick in some cases. So, it does the trick in dimensions larger than or equal to 6, when the manifold M is not locally conformally uh, flat. So th those were the cases that were solved by Obama, and the other cases were more, di more difficult because constructing a test function turn turns out to be uh, a lot harder, and that was what uh, Schoen did. Okay, but this is all I want to say about uh, uh, the Yamabe problem. Of course, if the, this Yamabe invariant is less than or equal to zero, then the, 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 the answer is clear, okay? So I will assume from now on that the Yamaha invariant is strictly positive, okay? So now let us turn to our attention to the question about uh, optimal partitions, okay? So what is an optimal partition or what is the question we want to address now, okay? So the question we want to address is the following one. Okay, so we have our closed Riemannian manifold with a given metric, and now we give a number L larger than or equal to 2, okay? And the question is, does there exist a partition of M by L pairwise disjoint open subsets, omega 1 up to omega L, and a two tensor field G twiddles on M with the following properties. We want that G twiddles is a metric on G, uh, uh, conformally equivalent to G, on each one of these omega i's. And we want it to be zero in the complement. In the, so in M minus the union of the omegas. So this is the G twiddles is not going to be a metric all over the place, but it's only going to be a metric on each one of these open sets. And of, on each one of these open sets, we want it to be conformally equivalent to the given metric and to have constant scalar curvature on each one of these guys. And then we also want some kind of minimization problem, uh, property. So we want the Yamabe invariance on the sets, the sum of the Yamabe invariance, to be minimal in some sets. So let me be now more precise. Let me write the same problem in terms of uh, a PDE. Okay? So we are looking for a partition. So what is a partition? It's simply a collection of L open sets that are pairwise disjoint and non-empty and open, right? And what is an optimal L partition for the Yamabe equation? Well, this is simply uh, something that has two properties. So, so the first thing we want is that on each one of these open sets, this, the Yamabe equation with zero boundary conditions has a, a a positive solution. And this positive solution should minimize this Yamabe quotient, where now I am taking the Yamabe quotient only on each omega i. 
right? So this is one property. And the other property is a global one. So I want that the sum of the Yamaba invariance in the pieces is minimal with respect to any possible partition that I can take that satisfies the first property. Okay. So I, this probably will, will become a bit clearer in just a moment, but anyhow, this is, this, is, this is what we are looking for. So the question is, does there exist an optimal partition on any manual? Of course, if L is equal 1, then looking for an optimal partition is simply looking for a solution to the Yamabe equation. So if L is equal 1, the answer is yes. But if L is larger than or equal to 2, the answer is not always. So for example, the standard sphere does not admit an optimal L partition for any L. And the reason is again this dilation invariance. Because what happens, I mean, when one can look at the problem, instead of looking at the problem on the sphere, we, one can look at the problem on RM, right? It is the same via the, the stereographic projection. And uh, since we have this dilation invariance and we, this, this uh, uh, quantity here uh, can be realized by, by the bubbles and the dial, dilated bubbles, you can easily see that the Yamabe uh, invariant in the domain omega is the same as the Yamabe invariant for Rn. And since this is true, then if this invariant, the Yamabe invariant in omega, were attained at U with this boundary condition, with zero conditions at the boundary, then this other guy would, all, would be attained at the function that extends the solution by zero outside omega. And this would give you a solution of this PDE in Rn. Positive solution of this PDE in Rn. But there is a very uh, famous principle, a very standard classical principle in PDE called the maximum principle that says you cannot have a positive solution of a PDE like this, which is zero in some open set. Solutions cannot be zero in an open set, okay? So what this is telling us is that there is no hope of finding an optimal partition on the sphere because simply the first condition, this one, is not satisfied, it's never satisfied, okay? So then the real question we want to answer is whether one can give some conditions on the manifold, on the metric, right, for the existence of an optimal partition. So, th what this proposition is saying is that this is an interesting question, that not every manifold admits something like this. So, this is telling us admitting an optimal partition is saying something about the geometry, about the geometry of the manifold, right? So what we want to do is what we want to give conditions for the existence of an optimal partition uh, on, on the manifold, on the given manifold. Okay. So the first thing is, well, how does one find optimal partitions? Okay. And this is where physics comes in. Okay. So there is a very uh, nice phenomenon in quantum physics called, uh, uh, well, there are this, this, uh, uh, this phenomenon uh, related to Bose-Einstein condensates. So what is a Bose-Einstein condensate? Well, this is a state of matter. So there are certain particles that are called bosons that uh, when they are cooled down to almost zero temperature, they change states and they become a single, I mean, they are, sep at the beginning, they are separated particles. They are, when you cool them down to almost zero temperature, what happens is that, that they become a different uh, uh, quantum entity. And when you take several kinds, so different kinds of particles with this property, so if you take a mixture of particles 
uh, having this property and you cool them down, what happens is that this condensate, this Bose-Einstein condensates, occupy different portions of space. So they separate in, in, in space and each of the, each type of particle, say, occupies a portion of space and they fill the whole space. Okay? So this is precisely what we want. We want to, 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 to have a partition of space. So now the mathematical model, okay, that describes this phenomenon is a system of elliptic equations. So it's a system like this in R3 because this is a physical phenomenon, okay. So the beha behavior of a mixture of both sides and condensates is described by a system of elliptic equations. So this beta ii's represent the force between particles of the same type, of type I, say, and the beta ij represents the force between particles in two different, of two different types, say, okay? And the, the, in the phenomenon, in the, what I just described, the interaction between particles in the same state is attractive, which means the beta ii is positive, and the interaction between particles in two different states is repulsive. So this means these beta ij's are negative. Okay? And then if you keep beta ii fixed and you let the beta ij's go to minus infinity, so if you increase the repulsive forces, then what happens is that if you look at least energy solutions of the system, the components become separately, uh, especially separated. And this phenomenon is called phase separation and uh, is precisely what, uh, what we want. And in fact, the, the, the first uh, people that realize that this, there is a connection between this uh, phenomenon and uh, uh, optimal partitions. Well, this is expressed in two papers, one by Conti, Terracini and Bertini in 2004, and the other one by Chang, Lin, Lin and Lin in 2004 also. Okay? So this is, we are going to take advantage of this uh, fact to uh, find a, a, a op an optimal partition for the Yamabe, system, the Yamabe equation. So we are going to look at the, Yama at the Yamabe system, right? So we are now on the manifold M. This part, the, the, the left-hand side in the equality and the first summand, summand is just the Yamabe equation. But now we have this interaction term, right? Where this gamma is going to be half the, the critical Sobolev exponent because we want that this uh, right hand side has the same degree as, as, as we have here, okay? So gamma plus gamma minus one is precisely what we have right here. Okay, so this is, this is a system we're going to look at, okay? And uh, we are going to assume that the lambdas, the lambda ij's are negative, and the lambda ii, I will take it equal to one as I did for the Yamabe problem, right? And what I want to find is, uh, well, what I want to study is whether the system has a non-trivial solution. I mean, of course, if you forget that, about this last term and you solve the Yamabe equation, and you put all other components equal to zero, you get a solution, but this is not what we want. So what we want is to find solutions that are, that are called fully non-trivial, which means every ui has to be different from zero, okay? So this is what we are looking for. So what, what, we, what we are going to do, so the first thing is, we want to give conditions for the existence of a fully non-trivial least energy solution of the Yamabe system, okay? This is the first thing. Once we have a least energy solution, then we want to study the behavior 
of the limit profile of the components as the lambdas go to minus infinity. Okay? And then we want to see whether these limit profiles will give us an optimal partition. Because this is what we are looking for, really. Okay? And then, well, once we have achieved this, we would like to say something about the boundary of the partition, right? How does, does the partition look like? So this is the problem, program, this is the strategy. And, uh, well, then I, now I will show you some results. I won't go into the details because they are very technical and I, I don't want to bore you. So, but I will, I will show you some results that uh, we obtain in collaboration with Angela Pistoia from La Sapienza in Rome and Hugo Tavares from, from Lisbon. Okay, so these are the results. So the first result is about existence, and the existence result says if the manifold is not locally conformally flat and has dimension larger than or equal 9, then the Yamabe system has indeed a fully non-trivial least energy solution, whose components, in fact, all of them are positive. Okay, so now this is not a, a, a trivial result because, for example, this system, if you take M to be the round sphere, this does not have a least energy solution for any L. Okay, so at least this not locally conformally flat seems to be needed because the sphere is, of course, locally conformally equivalent to Rm, which is flat. This uh, uh, condition on the dimension comes from, well, a test function. So, as I showed you for the Yamabe equation, also for the system, we have the problem with blow up. So, one needs to, to, to give a compactness condition that will tell you if some inequality holds true, then there is no blow up. Like, like in the case of Yamabe, like the condition of Obama, it's the same type of idea, only that here it is more complicated. So then one needs to have a test function. And when one takes the, a test function that is kind of the natural test function that one expects and one computes, then you arrive at this condition that says the dimension must be larger than or equal nine. Okay, so here is an existence result and now we want to say something about the behavior of the components as the lambdas go to minus infinity. So you may, we make lambda go to minus infinity, we take a least energy positive fully non-trivial solution of the system, right? And we want to see how the components behave, okay? And here we need, again, I mean, here again, we have the problem with blow up. So again, we need to put a condition on the manifold. And here the condition is again, the manifold cannot be locally conformally flat. But now the dimension has to be larger than or equal 10. And in the case the dimension is 10, we need this other condition, which is a condition relating the scalar curvature for the given metric and the vial tensor for the given metric. The vial tensor is kind of the part of the curvature tensor that is conformally invariant. Okay? So this is a, a, a the vial tensor is something that appears in a very natural way in this type of problems. Okay? So then the result says the following thing. If you look at the components, they will converge to a function which is continuous, which is larger than or equal to zero, which is non-trivial, and then if it is continuous, if it is non-negative and non-trivial, we can look at the set omega i 
where it is strictly positive, right? This will be non-empty and open. And one can see that this guy solves the Yamabe equation in this open set with zero boundary condition. So these omega eyes are the candidates for the partition we are looking for. And indeed, this omega 1 up to omega L is an optimal L partition for the Yamabe equation. And in particular, it is easy to see that each one of these guys is connected. Now, what happens with the complement? So, if you, we take M and we subtract the union of these open sets, this looks like an M minus one dimensional CW complex in the, in the language of topology. So, this looks like the union of a regular part and a singular part. The regular part is a C1 alpha submanifold of dimension M minus one of M. And the singular part has house of dimensions smaller than or equal to m minus 2. Okay? And in particular, what this says is that you take m and you take the closures of the omegas, then m is the union of the closures of this omega. So this is really a, a, a partition. Okay? And finally, uh, another consequence that we get here is that. Uh, in the case that L is equal to 2, so if you only have two equations, right, then you only have two functions, right? You have two components, you have two functions. Each one of these functions is positive in, in some part of the domain. And then you can look at the difference of these two functions. So this gives you a function that changes sign. Right? It is positive in a piece of M and it is negative in another piece of M. And in fact, this is a least energy nodal solution to the Yamabe equation. And this actually was our, our starting point. So, so what we wanted to do, we were studying the Yamabe equation and we wanted to find sign changing solutions for the Yamabe equations. This is where we started. And because there is a, 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 a very nice result by uh, Aman and Umber from 2006, where they showed that the, indeed the Yamabe equation on the manifold M always has a least energy nodal solution provided the manifold is not locally conformally flat and the dimension is larger than or equal to 11. So our result improves this result just a little bit, right? A little bit in the sense that uh, we get also a result in dimension 10 if this condition holds true, okay? So this seems that uh, this, um, so this, this, this makes, makes, makes us suspect that in fact the conditions that we give should be kind of optimal. I mean, when one does the computations at one, one arrives to this feeling, it is not a conclusion, it's just the feeling, but uh, well, uh, seems to, to, to be that way. Okay, okay. so the, the Yamabe equation has least energy solutions sometimes. It does not have a least energy nodal solution on the sphere, for example. So the question is, does the Yamabe equation have higher energy nodal solutions in some Riemannian manifolds? For example, in the sphere. So, in the sphere there is no uh, least energy nodal solution, but perhaps one can find other nodal solutions, right? And this brings me to the last part of my talk, Andrew Schulke. So I am going to look now for, for partitions with symmetries. So I will look at the, the manifold M and I will take a group of isometries of M and as usual I will, I will uh, uh, look at the G orbit of the point. It's just you take the point and you apply 
all elements of g to the point, and that's the g orbit. Okay. So, for example, the example I am interested in is the, the standard sphere, and uh, I am going to look at this group. Okay, so I write Rm plus 1 as Rn1 times Rn2 with n1 plus n2, we were m plus 1. And I look at this group, so the group of linear isometries in uh, R, Rn1 and the group of linear isometries in Rn2. Okay, so then the orbits are either uh, a product of spheres or a single sphere. Right? Here is a picture in uh, S3, or rather in R3, of the orbits. So some orbits are tori, right? And there are two special orbits. One is a circle right here, and the other one is another circle uh, represented by the, the uh, uh, X3 axis. Okay? And now, uh, the, the main thing is that uh, if n1 and n2, like it happens in this case, are larger than or equal to, then every orbit has a dimension larger than or equal 1. So here we have a circle, here we have a circle, and here we have a two-dimensional torus, right? So in this case, every orbit, the, the, I mean, there are no orbits consisting of a, sing, of a single point or a finite number of points. All orbits have positive, uh, have dimension larger than or equal to 1, okay? And then in this case, well, one can, uh, again, extend the concept and look for symmetric optimal partitions just by putting G invariant in the definition all over the place. So we are now looking for optimal partitions where the components are G invariant, the functions are G invariant, and so forth and so on. And then in this case, one has the following result. The result says, if, as in the example I just men mentioned, the dimension of every orbit is larger than or equal 1 and uh, smaller than m, then there is always an optimal partition, an optimal G invariant L partition for the Yamada equation. Look that here, I am not imposing any condition, I am not saying it is not locally conformally flat, or it has dimension so and so, but the only condition is on the action, on the dimension of the orbits. So for example, uh, in the, uh, for the sphere, and the example I just told you about, there is indeed a partition like this, which is gene variant for that kind of, of groups. Right? And the reason is very, very easy. So this result indeed is quite easy to prove because what happens is that what makes the, the problem in general very, very complicated is that one has blow up. But here, since we are looking for solutions that are constant on the orbits, and the orbits have dimension one, and blow up occurs only at points, one cannot have blow up. So this is, the, this is the main idea, and since blow-up cannot occur, okay, because the dimension of the orbit is larger than or equal to 1, well, then you get uh, indeed an optimal partition. And this happens, now let me go to the, to the example, so this is the example I just mentioned before, so we look at uh, this uh, action on the sphere, right, so these are the orbits, and the orbit space is simply an arc, right? The orbit space is an arc, and the endpoints of the arc correspond to the orbits that are just the spheres, and every point in the interior of the arc corresponds to orbits that uh, are a product of spheres, right? So in this case, it's very easy to look for a partition because a partition on, on the sphere will give a partition on this interval, right? So an optimal partition just looks like this. It looks like uh, uh, some set that is represented by this green solid torus 
Then the next one is the difference between the yellow solid torus and the green one. The next one is the blue one minus the, the yellow one. And the last one is the complement, right? So in the case of the sphere, one indeed gets optimal partitions for these particular types, type of groups that looks like the, look like this. And the intersection of the sets is just uh, the, the toroidal surface, say, or it is empty. And if you take now the, the functions that are the limit profiles of the system, and you put, uh, write the sum with alternating signs, then what you get is a nodal solution for the Yamabe equation in the, in the sphere, which has precisely L nodal domains and has least energy among all of these solutions. Okay? So now, just to conclude, let me mention that one already knew that uh, there are many uh, uh, sign-changing solutions for the Yamabe equation on the sphere, and this was proved already in 1986 by Ding. So he proved the existence of infinitely many sign-changing solutions for the Yamabe equation on the, uh, in, the, in the sphere, right? And uh, 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 these two guys, Juan Carlos Fernandez and Jimmy Petian, using ODE method recently showed that in fact one can produce a solution that changes sign precisely L time, so that it has precisely L nodal domains. And the additional information that uh, we got with uh, Saldana and Shulkin is that indeed this solution that we get is the least energy, has least energy among all possible solutions with L nodal domains, okay? I am speaking, of, of course, here of, of solutions that uh, have this uh, symmetry side I talk, talked about, so this G invariant solutions, okay? And this is all I, I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> okay, do we have any questions for uh, Monica? So you, you meant that really this idea of partitions came from the Bose-Einstein equations from, from this setting? It comes from it, this setting in a very natural way. And also, for example, it comes from ecology when you look at systems of competing species, for example. Those are the natural places where this type of systems arise. And I think what is the really very nice is that uh, well, one sees this behavior. In fact, I mean this behavior of the mixtures of Bose-Einstein condensates. Well, this was predicted by Bose and Einstein about 100 years ago, right? And it was only proved experimentally about uh, 25 years ago. Uh -huh. So it is a very new phenomenon also in physics. And well, what we actually do is we, we look at the, at the mathematical model that describes this phenomena, right? And this is what, what gives the optimal partitions. And I think this is, this is very nice. Of course, there, there has been a lot of work by, by many people describing, well, the, 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 the free boundaries and all that. And I mean, it's, uh, I think it's a, a nice thing to look at, um, at contributions from, from other fields to mathematics. How can one use some ideas in other fields? to produce results in mathematics. Nice. Are there any other questions for Monica? And I'll see you. Sorry, and just another question. The methods are these methods from analysis, from PDs and analysis, right? Yes, 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 absolutely, yes, yes. We don't have any more questions. Then I will thank you again for this very nice and interesting presentation and we go on in the next edition. Thank you.